So this is part two uh, of topic four, which is the first topic in the natural channels module. And in this topic, we deal with incipient motion. And we'll be talking about the conditions uh, under which incipient motion occurs and how that those conditions are modeled in practice. So in this video we can see sand grains that are being uh, mobilized, so they're passing through this condition of incipient motion. I'm going to replay the video but at a slower speed and highlight some of these individual grains which are reaching these conditions of incipient motion. So in that video we saw a lot of sand grains that are either mobile or stationary and when they moved from being stationary to mobile they were passing through this condition called incipient motion. To understand the physics of that condition we need to think about the force balance on the particle. So we have five forces acting on the particle to think about. We have the weight force acting downwards, we have a force upwards from the bed, we have a drag force to the right produced by flow passing around the particle. As flow accelerates over the top of the particle, we get a reduction in pressure according to Bernoulli's principle, and that produces a lift force. And finally, there's a resistance force applied from the bed on the particle in the upstream direction that resists the drag force. Now there are three um, conditions that can produce incipient motion. The first one is where the lift force equals the weight force. Um, and at that point the particle is about to lift up off the bed. The second one is where the drag force equals the resistance force. And at that point the particle is about to slide down the stream. And the third one is where the overturning moment produced by drag and resistance which act um, uh, at the upper and the lower uh, sides of the particle respectively um, equal the resisting moment from the particle. So they are the three conditions that can, can produce incipient motion. Now, resolving these physics analytically um, is, is not possible yet. And most engineers, when they are modeling um, incipient motion conditions, use empirical relationships based on experimental um, results to, to model um, under what conditions the bed sediments will be mobilized. One such relationship is the Hulström curve. Hulström was a, Philip Hulström was a um, physical geographer who worked in Sweden uh, in the, the middle of the 20th century. Um, and he, um, based on experimental studies, generated this graph which shows um, under, uh, for, for different grain sizes, the velocity under which um, there's transportation of um, the sands, deposition, or erosion. So if sand particles are, um, if we just think about say sand particles here of say 0.5 millimeters, then if they're mobile and the velocity falls below um, uh, one or two um, centimeters per second, then there's deposition of those sand particles. If it's between, um, uh, if it's above two centimeters and they're mobile, then they'll be transported. If they're stable uh, and, and deposited on the bed um, and the velocity is low but it increases, then it's got to increase all the way up to 
over 10 centimeters per second before it's um, eroded and mobilized. So this is the mobilization zone, the erosion zone up here. This is the deposition zone down here. And in between here is the transportation zone. And these two um, curves separate down the lower end of silts and clays where you have the more uh, what's called cohesive sediments. So when it's deposited and settled on the bed, there's um, additional forces that bond the particles together more than just gravity. And so you need um, additional force from the higher velocities to, um, to produce, um, to mobilize um, that sediment. Douglas Shields provide a, a, a model for the conditions of incipient motion based on the, a critical shear stress at which um, motion was initiated. And he proposed that this critical shear strep stress was dependent on um, a number of hydraulic variables, the difference in density of particles relative to the water, uh, rho s minus rho w, the diameter of the particle, the kinematic viscosity of the particle of the water, and gravitational acceleration. And he used these, uh, uh, these, these five um, variables plus the critical shear stress to construct dimensionless variables. The dimensionless shear stress, that's um, this um, term here, tau c being the, the critical shear stress for incipient motion, um, and um, this dimensionless form of particle size d. And the relationship that he generated um, is shown here. It was generated experimentally. You can see a bunch of experimental studies with different symbols um, plotted on the curve. We've got this um, variable which is dependent on particle size, and we've got the critical shear stress, the dimensionless version of the critical shear stress on the on the y-axis. And we see a dip, a minimum point um, for intermediate particle sizes increasing at coarser particle size and also at, uh, at finer particle sizes, not dissimilar to the, the Hulstrom curve. Um, but the problem with um, this relationship is that the dimensionless particle size variable includes the bed shear stress. And the bed shear stress is a function of uh, the, the, um, so the shear velocity, the U, U star. And this U star uh, at the critical condition is also dependent on the shear stress. So to be able to calculate this variable, we already know, need to know what the critical shear stress is, but we actually want to use the relationship to determine the critical shear stress, so it's somewhat circular. Um, there was an easy workaround for this, and there's a modification cur modified curve now, which is, which is, which is available um, for use. And that uses... Um, expresses the critical um, dimensionless shear stress, so the same term that, um, uh, the same variable that Shields used, but a different um, independent variable, the, the particle Reynolds number. Um, and again, this is Shields dimensionless um, critical shear stress, and here's the formula for the Reynolds particle number, which is a function of particle diameter, the kinematic viscosity, gravitational acceleration, and the density of the sediment and the density of water um, shown here. And the, uh, the curve, which again, it's experimentally um, derived, uh, is shown here. Uh, we see that this sort of sand-sized particles give the minimum dimensionless uh, critical shear stress. Um, and for coarse particles up around, uh, you know, coarse gravels and cobbles, um, the dimensionless uh, critical shear stress becomes insensitive to variation in um, um, bed sediment size and, and constant at around a value of 0 0.03. So here's some additional resources um, where these relationships are applied to engineering problems um, and that's all we've got for this uh, part two of the module. There's a third part um, available on the web as well.